Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, a, a question on the cybersecurity topic, if I could, um, and as it relates to China in particular. Are you concerned about the uh, growing practice of American technology companies, or any American companies for that matter, storing large amounts of data, consumer data, uh, business data uh, in China, and uh, sometimes storing the encryption keys to that data in China? I mean, does this, does this, what sort of a cybersecurity risk does this pose? Is this something you're tracking that you're concerned about? Uh, it is something that we're concerned about, uh, in part because Chinese laws require a level of access um, that is unparalleled, certainly in this country, uh, in terms of law enforcement and security services. Uh, Chinese law essentially compels Chinese companies and typically compels U.S. companies that are, are operating in China to have relationships with different kinds of Chinese companies. Um, to provide whatever information the government wants, whenever it wants, essentially just for asking. Um, and so that creates all kinds of risks, uh, you know, across the various threats that we have to contend with. And that, your point there about the, the Chinese laws and the access to data that Beijing requires sort of works in, in two ways, doesn't it? I mean, it, it, is a, it is a problem for American companies who choose to store large amounts of data in China because to do so, they have to partner under Chinese laws with, with some sort of Chinese counterpart that often has ties to the government, right? That's number one. But number two, it's also a security risk from the point of view of Chinese-based companies who have access to our market, who do business here, gather large amounts of information on American consumers like TikTok, for instance, but actually are, are owned or based in China and therefore are subject to those, those same Chinese laws on, uh, on data and data sharing. Is that, is that fair to say? Uh, that's absolutely something that we're concerned about. Uh, even you start with the, the proposition that a astonishing percentage of Chinese companies are in fact state-owned enterprises. But even the ones that are not technically state-owned enterprises, the ones that are ostensibly private, are subject both to the Chinese laws that I referred to a minute ago, as well as, and I think a lot of people just kind of gloss right over this, any Chinese company of any appreciable size has, by Chinese law, embedded in them Chinese Communist Party cells, or committees as they're called, whose sole function is to ensure that that company stays in lockstep with the Chinese Communist Party's policies. Can you imagine something like that happening with American companies and American policy? I mean, it, it, it's something that people need to take very seriously. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for your, your work on this. I think, as you point out, I think American consumers don't realize the threat to, to their own data security and privacy uh, when American companies choose to, to store that data in China and thereby open up uh, potentially that data to use by the Chinese government, or they don't realize that Chinese-based companies who are doing business in this country are subject to those same laws. And so it, 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 works, it works both ways. Um, switching gears, uh, Secretary Glaway, let me ask you about the border. Uh, Senator Portman was talking about the influx of, of meth and the serious effects it has in Ohio. I can tell you in the state of Missouri, we are absolutely overwhelmed with meth coming across from the border. I mean, there is not a community in my state, urban, rural, north, south, east, west, that is not just awash in, in meth. You pointed out that uh, between, I think it was 2017 and 2019, that uh, the southern border apprehensions up over 200% for meth. Um, I just wanted to, to, to drill down on a few additional details here and, and to get to to get your input. Did I hear you to say to Senator Portman that the meth apprehensions, other drug apprehensions have continued to increase even as border apprehensions of illegal individuals has decreased? Is that, is that right? That is correct. And, and, and again, this is a two-year snapshot. So it was cocaine 40 percent, fentanyl 20 percent, heroin 30 percent, and methamphetamine 200 percent. And that's at the border. Um, that's at the border is where we're seizing that. That's in addition to the migration um, challenges we've had, but just by officers taken offline with the detention processing, we're still seeing the numbers up. And is that, do you have any sense in the last few months, I know that we've seen a decline in the last few months of border apprehensions of individuals, but it, it, do you have a sense or do you know what the uh, numbers for um, contraband look like? Uh, Senator, we could, we could get back for, uh, as a QFR on that, but what I would say, and I said this earlier, is uh, 
the business model for the cartels is to move illicit goods and people across the border to get them there and to move them. And that grows through a very sophisticated network inside the, inside the, the country of Mexico and south of Mexico, as well as, as, as a, a management structure called plaza bosses that occupy the entire southwest border. Um, they control what goes across and what does not go across. And it's all based on money of moving people and goods. Let me ask you this. You uh, talked about fentanyl production moving at least to some degree to Mexico, so from China to Mexico, although it sounds like maybe in partnership with uh, Chinese outlets. Can you say something more about that? Um, what I would say is that we, we, we may want to have to take this one in a, in a classified setting, but we have seen that the fentanyl production and trafficking, as, as we would anticipate, the cartels own the supply chain in the United States and the trafficking routes getting in here, um, that that fentanyl production and trafficking would begin to move into Mexico, and we are seeing that. Hmm. Um, finally, let me ask you this. You said that uh, in order to address this, this crisis, the drug crisis and the flow of drugs over the border, it would require a change in our whole strategic approach. Can you say more about what you have in mind and, and what you think needs to change, maybe what this committee and this body would do to give you the tools that you need? Well, I, I would say is I, I'd welcome a conversation that would probably expand upon my partners here at this table. Um, but in my prior capacity as, as a unique witness, I was the Deputy National Intelligence Manager for Transnational Organized Crime and when I was at the ODNI. And when I say that is the strategic approach, what I mean is bringing law enforcement, U.S. intelligence community, Mexican intelligence community, and military assets to bear um, in Mexico in some of these lawless areas where the cartels are essentially running the area. Um, but that also has to be hand in glove. Uh, with our demand. The U.S. Uh, has a high demand for narcotics. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a joint process, and it, it's in that realm of having that partnership with our, our Mexican counterparts uh, in that space um, to identify the bad and fill it with the good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Holliday. Before I turn to Senator Peters, just a quick follow-up, because uh, I think you, we need to underscore this. So although our border is rather unsecure on our side, would you agree with this statement that on the Mexican side of the border, it's pretty secure. There's not much that passes through the Mexican side of the border without uh, Mexico, uh, the cartels and human traffickers knowing about it, correct? Uh, the plaza bosses and the cartels um, run the south side of the border on the Mexico side. Uh, does the Mexican military and law enforcement have the capability? They do. But we right then, it's going to require a strategic approach of how those resources are deployed in partnership with us. But the cartels are incredibly powerful. And we also have to bear in mind there's a corruption angle that plays into this as well. So where there's a, a will and a, where there's a will to secure a border, there's a way, and Mexican cartels prove it on the southern side. Uh, Chairman Johnson, you're, you're, I think your assessment there is correct, uh, but there are models out there. We've been successful. Colombia is, is a model of success we had uh, in partnership with that government years ago. Senator Peters. Hey, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I just want to follow up on uh, what, I, what I, I hope is the priority for, for all three of you, and that's to combat foreign influence uh, in our elections. Uh, uh, Director Ray, my question to you, and, and I think it's, it's accurate, that's a priority for you, is yes or no? Absolutely. Uh, what direction, if any, have you received from the White House about the priority of foreign influence uh, in our elections? I think it's been made crystal clear to us that it is a priority for us to combat malign foreign influence from any nation state, including Russia, including China, including Iran, uh, and others. Uh, how has that been communicated to you by the White House? Well, I mean, we've had numerous uh, meetings uh, over at the White House uh, uh, with the NSC and with others uh, on, on election security issues. Um, and. And so it's been sort of a recurring theme in those meetings. Is the White House doing anything to coordinate uh, with other security agencies? Are they pulling folks together in a coordinated fashion, in your estimation? And if you could uh, explain how that's happening? Well, I mean, certainly we've had, uh, as I said, we've had NSC meetings and NSC-driven coordination over the time that I've been uh, director. Uh, but in particular, uh, the way it works right now is that with the NSC's direction and the White House's direction, ODNI uh, brings together a smaller group as opposed to the more sprawling NSC apparatus. Uh, in particular, it's us, FBI, ODNI, DHS, and NSA are the sort of the key players and then others from time to time uh, as, as need uh, arises. And there's all kinds of engagement between, for example, our Foreign Influence Task Force, which I stood up after becoming director, 
uh, the Russia small group at NSA that uh, General Nakasone stood up, and there's a you know similar type of body at DHS and so on at ODNI, and there's a uh, a woman at ODNI, very uh, uh, very experienced, very seasoned, who uh, then Director Coates put, and she has remained in charge of kind of coordinating the efforts, kind of on a more day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I uh, continue to hear from my constituents in Michigan about uh, very lengthy and intrusive screenings uh, every time uh, they travel, uh, Secretary Glaue. Uh, they describe it as a backdoor travel ban uh, that discourages them from traveling, and it hurts uh, their business uh, and their families, uh, and certainly maintaining uh, safe and secure air travel while protecting civil rights of law-abiding travelers is a, is a balance we may have to achieve, as we talked about earlier. You have a lot of balances that you have to do in your agency. But my question to you is the department has indicated to my staff that they will now lead a comprehensive review of secondary screenings in fiscal year 2020 with input from other relevant federal partners. Could you describe how you would envision that process and how you would expect those recommendations to come out? Uh, Recommender Peters, I, I'd have to take that, that question for the record to go back to U.S. Customs and Border Protection. It sounds like who would be leading that because they're, they're the ones that do the secondary inspections. Um, but what I can say uh, is coming from that organization is we are always cognizant of the civil rights and civil liberties of U.S. citizens, foreign citizens that are traveling to the United States. And the protocols and the oversight with that has, has been very rigorous. But I'll take that for the record and come back for an answer with you. You could do that um, uh, in a quick manner. I would appreciate it. Uh, I, the vast majority of constituents that I've also hear from are, are, are very uh, d deeply dissatisfied with the DHS uh, trip which is, as you know, the redress uh, process for travelers who experience uh, screening uh, difficulties. Uh, are there ways to expand and strengthen TRIP so that applicants don't feel ignored? And do you have some specific recommendations how we can make this process more efficient? Uh, again, similar to my prior answers, being the head of intelligence, I'll have to take that back for the record and have an answer for you on that. Mà thương sao mà xa gì 
ơi cô ca nặng tình nặng nghĩa có lúc nào anh giận em không có lúc nào anh giận em không để thương suốt cả ngày anh giận khi xa nhau đến ngàn vạn dặm giận chẳng có mà thương rộng dài thế em nhớ ngày em nhớ đêm giận mà thương chảy lòng em đỏ thương mà giận dễ gì đã có em chỉ tìm thấy ở chỉ để em